Carl Gauthier, uh, MMM uh, CD, was born and raised uh, in Montreux, Quebec, and holds a degree in history. After having been an air cadet, uh, he began his military career at, as a cadet instructor, while he completed his studies before serving for nearly five years in the Wing Heritage Officer, as the Wing Heritage Officer at uh, Three Wing Bagatelle, Quebec, where he contributed to the opening and operation of Bagatelle Air Defense Museum. He has been employed in, as what is known as the Director director as of History, or sorry, Honors and Recognition at the Department of National Defense in Ottawa since 2002, and has been the Director since 2013. Please join me in welcoming uh, Lieutenant Carl Gauthier. Thank you very much. Recognition and honors have been a passion of mine since I was in the air cadets a long time ago, and so um, I do not uh, know what I know because of the job I have, but I have the job I have because I know what I know, if you follow me. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about military recognition, uh, the structure that we have in Canada now and its various components, but before we do that, of course, we're going to do a little bit of a historical background or check as to what uh, was used to recognize military service uh, before we created our modern honor system. Uh, go a little bit over the nomination process, how it works, um, and, uh, and then of course at the end I will uh, take uh, some questions uh, if you have any. So do not hesitate to interrupt me during the presentation as we go along if you have specific questions. Um, otherwise, uh, if you have any, any generic ones, we can wait for, uh, for the end. So, starting with a bit of history here, uh, the concept of recognition, of course, is not new. Uh, we know that in the Western cultures, the presentation of physical insignia to be worn uh, to recognize physically distinguished people who had uh, uh, done some amazing work goes back a long time. We can look back at the history of Greece and ancient Rome and find that uh, soldiers were awarded various wreaths uh, as well as some medallions to be worn on their armor to signify the gallantry they had displayed in combat or the leadership they are displayed uh, leading battle. Uh, of course, there's a whole concept of chivalry in Europe uh, and then the more modern decorations for merit uh, and campaign service uh, which came about mostly in the 19th and the 20th century. Now, focusing on Canada, of course, uh, our um, First Nations always had a concept of honor. However, uh, they are not beyond in the honors in a physical sense that we understand them now in terms of medals hanging from ribbons. But of course, they had great warriors who distinguished themselves in battles, and they had ways to recognize that, to acknowledge this bravery uh, displayed in the face of the enemy. And that took some, in some cases, physical forms, that included, for example, facial tattoos um, and some uh, ornaments uh, on, the, uh, on the dresses and the uh, clothing, and also the presentation of the famous eagle feather, which was a great honor, usually earned in battle. But there were also non-physical forms of, um, <clears throat> of recognition, such as the title of chief, uh, or simply the place of honor that one would be given uh, in the community, uh, and the respect that was paid to them, they had the right to uh, speak first uh, and were you know, recognized as an authority in the group. So, so that concept was very much present in Canada well before the arrival of Europeans. Of course, uh, what is now called Canada uh, during the, uh, <clears throat> the 17th uh, and the 18th century was in part occupied by, uh, the France, uh, the, by France and the uh, new French uh, system you made use of royal French honors, and mostly it was uh, the uh, uh, l'ordre militaire et royal de Saint Louis, better known as la Croix de Saint Louis, the uh, Saint Louis Cross, that was used to recognize Canadians who had distinguished themselves uh, in battle, but also in the uh, administration of the colony. Uh, and you have an example here uh, in the center right of uh, an insignia of knight of the uh, Royal and Military Order of St. Louis. About 300 Canadians were actually admitted to this order, which was founded uh, back in 1693 uh, in three grades, uh, Knight, uh, Officer, or Commander rather, and Grand Cross. Um, and so that was used, 
And Canadians, even after the conquest, after the British took over, uh, some uh, people who had fought on the French side continued to be recognized after that date through that order by the French government. <clears throat> now, of course, as the uh, time went by, uh, went by the uh, Canada became a British, and of course we started to make use of the British honor system, especially from the time of Confederation onwards. Uh, we made use of the full range of uh, British honors uh, in terms of peerages, knighthoods, as well as decorations for gallantry, campaign service, and military long service. Um, especially, like I said, from the 18... Uh, 50s and 60s onwards. So our veterans who served in the Boer War, in the two world wars, as well as in Korea, received decorations such as the Distinguished Service Order, the Military Cross, the Distinguished Flying Cross, you know, the Mention and Dispatches, Companion of the Order of the Bath, and things of that nature, which were part of the military culture in Canada for that entire period. <clears throat> of course, um, We've had difficulties in our experience with the British system, uh, especially on the civilian side. The military system has, you know, worked pretty much as it still does nowadays, but there have been some uh, political uh, issues that have surfaced, especially uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, concerning the use of British honors in Canada. Most of these honors um, were nominated or were put forward uh, by the Canadian government, sometimes by the governor general, sometimes without telling the prime minister, which caused some irritation uh, in some cases. Uh, prime Minister Laurier in uh, 1902 was quite upset when um, uh, Mr. Uh, Saunacy uh, from Montreal, who was a uh, president of the CPR and a great enemy of the prime minister, was elevated to the peerage as Lord Saunacy on the recommendation of the governor general, but without the prime minister's knowledge. It didn't help that the prime minister heard of the news uh, in the newspapers, as opposed from to hearing it from his governor general. So Wilfred Laurier at that point said very well, uh, from now on, uh, all honors will have to be approved by the prime minister. And of course, the colonial office that was still looking to us a bit like a, a colony, we were dominion by then, but still, uh, so oud and odd, and they said, well, yeah, we'll sort of respect that, but they were a bit uh, inconsistent in that practice. Um, as time went by, uh, that rule was generally followed, uh, and then the First World War occurred, and there were a few cases of uh, honors that were debatable. Um, you know, Sir Sam Hughes, that you may know of him, uh, famous or infamous, should I say, for the Ross Rifle uh, issue and, and management or mismanagement, some will say, um, under his, uh, uh, his tenure as Minister of National Defense. Um, eventually, he was made a Knight, Com Knight Commander of the Order of the Bath, and this attracted uh, significant criticism. Uh, the blow really came, however, um, when uh, Sir, um, I forget his name, Graham, uh, his last name was Graham, was elevated to the peerage as Lord Athelstan in 1917. Now, this chap was the, uh, the boss of the uh, the uh, Montreal uh, Star, uh, and uh, um, he was very unpopular, <laughs> and uh, some people said he was undeserving, and others said that he was both unpopular and undeserving. Uh, and this is an appointment that had been made not only without the Prime Minister's knowledge, it had actually been made against the Prime Minister's advice and against the Governor General's advice. So the British actually went forward while all the Canadians were saying, not a good idea. And that is the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, <clears throat> because at that time, it became quite well known, of course, that the British Prime Minister, Lord George, was actually selling honors. Uh, you know, if you made a contribution to his electoral campaign, uh, you could receive an honor. The bigger the check, the higher the honor. So a small check would get you, you know, a CMG or something like that, something slightly bigger might get you a knighthood, and if you're really generous, then a peerage, of course, is an order. It was actually a price list with the matching orders that existed. Um, of course, that was slightly unsavory to most people, um, and, and there was a huge debate in Canada, and there was certainly an impression, uh, if not a reality, that some of these honors, such as the one to Falston, was actually bought. 
uh, fair and square, <laughs> if we can say that, uh, and not deserved or earned. And so ensued uh, resolutions in Parliament, uh, and uh, you know, directive from the Prime Minister who was born at the time, and eventually, after much more debate, a, a, a report uh, by a special committee of the House of Commons. And the end result was that honors were going to stop in Canada. It, originally, the idea was to make sure that we're not going to have hereditary honors, like peerages, bestowed upon Canadians. And of course, in the political debate that ensued, you know, the distinction between knighthoods and peerages being lost on most politicians, the uh, proverbial baby was thrown out with the bathwater, and essentially all honors were out by the end of this debate, safe military honors for gallantry. So the Victoria Cross and things like that were still safe, but any other honor were essentially out. And that was in 1919. So our soldiers were recognized, and there were knighthoods, including, you know, Sir Arthur Currie and, and, and some people who contributed to the war all the way to 1918 uh, and 19. But once that was all over, then the tap was shot off and the fount of honors went dry for a number of years. Uh, of course, the Nickel Resolution, as it is called, because it was introduced by the Conservative uh, MP for Kingston, who was uh, named Nickel, and the report to the House of Commons was followed by a, uh, a motion in the House. Well, a resolution and a motion, they don't have the force of law. They basically express the opinion of the House at any given moment. So it was never a rule, an order in council, or an actual act that there shall be no peerages or knighthoods or honors to Canadians. But the question was so contentious that most politicians just steered away from it. <clears throat> and it's only Prime Minister Bennett in the 1930s that actually proved that it could work. Uh, and he used the honor system, <clears throat> a little bit like what Prime Minister uh, Borden had suggested, no peerages, but all other honors, including knighthoods, but not selected based on political affiliation, but really selected based on merit. And the Prime Minister consulted the Lieutenant Governors and a number of other people and built an honors list that actually was very, very well received by the general public and parliament when it came out in, the, <clears throat> in 1934 and 35. It included 18 knighthoods, and Sir Frederick Benting was among them. Um, Lucy Maud Montgomery was a CBE, and there was a number of other honors. You know, uh, Sir Thomas Chappé, the famous uh, French Canadian historian, was uh, in, on that list. And these people were from very broad range of activity, uh, all political stripes, and the list was very well received. <clears throat> the sad thing, of course, is that uh, although Prime Minister Bennett had a very good idea and made very good use of the honor system during his tenure, he did not have quite as much luck with the economy. Uh, this was the Great Depression, and of course, uh, when there was an election again, out he went, and Mackenzie King came back in. And Prime Minister Mackenzie King had a great phobia of honors, except when they were for himself. Um, and so uh, when he came back in, the attack was turned off once again, and that was the end of honors, both British and foreign to Canadians, uh, for a while again. Uh, then we come into the Second World War, and our Canadian forces become engaged. We go to, uh, to Europe, and we are in combat. Of course, it's clarified from the start that all gallantry honors are fine, but nothing else which quickly puts our forces at a great disadvantage because our colleagues from Australia, New Zealand, and India, and Britain are being recognized with OBEs and MBEs for major service away from the front or other types of contribution which are <clears throat> not available to Canadians. And so it took a long while for the government to come around, in fact, not for the government, I should say for the Prime Minister <laughs> to come around on this issue. It was not until 1942, so three years into the war, when it was actually decided very well, we will allow the non titular levels of the orders of chivalry to be used. So, not the knighthoods, anything that comes with a sir or dame is out, but CBEs or CBs, the CMGs, and everything below, that works. And that's what we use until the end of the Second World War. It was better than nothing, of course, but again, it left Canadians at a great disadvantage, especially for the higher ranking officers. You have people who are generals commanding, you know, huge formations in combat. And they have their colleagues being knighted, uh, you know, and made a uh, knight grand cross of the order of the bath, and, and you name it. And our Canadians are eligible. The highest thing they can get is a companion of the order of the bath, which usually goes to a brigadier. And when you're a three-star general equivalent, that doesn't quite cut it. 
and we had to be quite inventive, and in fact, we made use of the Order of the Companions of Honor, which was never intended when it was created in 1917 to be used for military service. It was supposed to be used for public service, science, the arts, literature, and things like that. But that's the only higher non titular honor that we could actually use, and people like General McNaughton and General Treyarch were appointed to that order uh, to sort of um, fill that gap. 1945 comes, uh, there's one civilian list of honors that the Prime Minister lets uh, come out in, in 1946, and then the fault runs dry again. Um, <clears throat> And then Korea happens. Uh, and then, of course, there's wing and oing, and it's quickly decided, okay, we're going to just use the policy we used in the Second World War. And we had Canadians recognized there with OBEs and CVEs, and, uh, you know, uh, Brigadier Rockingham, for example, receive a, a companion of the Order of the Bath for Korea. 1953 comes around, and once again, it, that's it. Uh, the Canadian forces are out uh, of recognition, and Canadian civilians, essentially, except for that one list of post-war civilian honors in 46, and that small window in 34, 35 by Prime Minister Bennett, there's been no civilian recognition for major service since 1990. None at all. And so in we go into the 50s and 60s, and there's ongoing debates about creating actual Canadian honors. Uh, and some things are done. Uh, you know, although it's not, strictly speaking, an honor, our first foray in that sort of field is the Memorial Cross, which we created in 1990. It's a memento, it's not a decoration, you know, to recognize the, the widows and the mothers of those who had fallen during the Great War, a, a memento that still exists today. Uh, then we had to wait until 1934, uh, where King George V created, on the recognition of the Government of Canada, a, a long service medal for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. During the Second World War, we created our own Canadian Service Medal to encourage volunteer service, the Canadian Volunteer Service Medal. The Canadian Forces Decoration, our long service decoration, we'll talk about it a bit later, uh, was created in 1949 and replaced a whole host of different British long service medals and decorations, which vary depending on if you were an uh, officer or an NCM, if you were Army, Navy, and Air Force, and if you were a permanent force or a reserve or auxiliary forces. It was quite complicated. Uh, and they all had different criteria, which made administration a complete nightmare. Uh, so the CD, 12 years for everybody who wears a uniform, uh, made things a lot simpler. And then the Korean medal in 1953, although it looks very much like the British one, the Canadian one is actually created on the recommendation of the Government of Canada. The obverse is different. It has the word Canada on it. It was paid by the Government of Canada, made in Canada out of silver when the Commonwealth one was made in the UK out of cupro nickel and had been created by the king when ours was created by the queen just after she ascended the throne. So they're quite distinct. Um, so these were first forays in the field of honors, but again, there was great reluctance about the, the political implications of getting deeper into this, especially if we mention civilian recognition. We have the same problem as in merit when we look at bravery not in the face of combat, no, no, in, not in, 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 under fire. <clears throat> and we continue to use British honors for that purpose, including for civilian cases, all the way into the 1960s. And so we use the George Cross, the George Medal, uh, the Air Force Cross for um, you know, um, aerial rescues, for example, as well as the um, gallantry uh, division of the uh, Order of the British Empire. And uh, we were just talking with some people here who actually know the last Canadian who was made an MBE for gallantry in 1968 uh, nurse Cashin for uh, attending to a crash site of a Czechoslovakian airplane that crashed in Gander in that year um, and, and did a tremendous job rescuing people in very awful conditions. <clears throat> so we were still making use of those British honors as we needed, really, but as time went by, there was a greater uh, intent to move away from that and create something Canadian, it's just that nobody could agree what it would be. At National Defense, since the Second World War, to try to fill that huge gap in recognition, we have been pushing proposal after proposal to create, you know, a whole host of decorations for, for uh, especially for merit, uh, including uh, schemes for a five-level Canadian order without knighthood attached. Um, but all of this uh, came to naught uh, because as soon as it reached the Prime Minister, the uh, you know the the, the wall came down, 
As you may know, there was one medal that was created after several attempts, uh, the Canada Medal. The Prime Minister finally relented and he created one medal called the Canada Medal that was going to recognize everything from major service to gallantry in the field, from heads of state to the private and the trenches. And of course, it was entirely you know, impractical uh, to try to recognize all uh, areas of merit by one single award. Uh, <clears throat> however, a list was made up. And of course, when it got to the Prime Minister, he could never make his mind up. He never signed it. No medal was ever awarded, and the whole thing was canceled when the Order of Canada was created 25 years later. Um, so, uh, so we find ourselves in the 1960s when Canada's national identity is growing, and we're trying to do more things uh, of our own, uh, and we're looking at national symbols. And as you know, Prime Minister Pearson pushed a number of those initiatives, including um, the new Canadian flag, uh, which was adopted after much, much acrimonious debate. Um, and once that was established, uh, he decided to turn his attention to honors and to solve that issue. Of course, Prime Minister Pearson um, had served uh, in the First World War and earned medals there, and had received an OBE himself as a diplomat uh, back in the 1930s list. So he knew about honors, and of course he had served in the British High Commission, um, you know, later on, and knew how the British system worked and how Canada found itself at a disadvantage because he was part of all those debates uh, about honors and, of course, was influenced a little bit by his then boss, Vincent Massey, who had been pushing also since the 1940s and especially as part of the Massey Commission in the 50s to create a Canadian order. So, all of this to say <clears throat> that uh, we launched into this finally in 1967, on the occasion of uh, the, uh, the Centennial of Confederation. So before we go there, just to give you a brief uh, overview of the structure that I mentioned in terms of gallantry recognition for the military under the British system. So you can see the Victoria Cross, of course, at the top, created during the Crimean War in 1956, retroactive to 54, And then it's organized uh, by level. So the top level is service neutral and rank neutral with the VC. And then as you go down, level two <clears throat> is dependent on rank and service. Rank uh, in terms of the DSO for officers, although three services combine. Other ranks have different medals, so the Conspicuous Gallantry Medal, uh, Navy and Air, and the Distinguished Conduct Medal for the Army. And then at level three, then you have two levels, one for officers, again different based on the three services, and medals for the non-commissioned members, and of course the mention and dispatchers at the bottom. So as you can see, it's a fairly complex system, but it really illustrates the society in which it was created. Uh, the British society in the late 19th century and early 20th century was very much still a class-oriented society where it really mattered. Uh, if you were an officer, usually you were from the upper classes, and usually the non-commissioned members were from the, the working classes, and, and there was these clear distinctions that were established uh, there, and, and that is reflected here. And most of this has endured in the United Kingdom until 1993, when uh, all of the gallantry recognition system was streamlined to become uh, entirely rank neutral uh, at all levels, and service neutral at all levels except at level three, where the DSC, MC, and DFC were conserved uh, only for traditional reasons, but they are now open to all ranks uh, in, those, uh, in those categories. So, back to 1967, Centennial, great occasion, Expo 67, and all the celebrations that went with it. This is the uh, pretext that was used to create our national order. Um, and it was, um, you know, very unique um, because of the experience we've had with the British system and when we compare with other systems like the French, and we'll mention that in a few minutes. This was the genesis and the cornerstone of what became a very complex and, and complete comprehensive honor system that you can see reflected on the poster over there on the easel, um, if you can actually see it. Um, but initially, the Order of Canada was supposed to be in three levels. But then again, when it got to cabinet, the memories of the earlier debates and the attempt to try to avoid any possible idea of class distinction or elitism or anything like that made it impossible for the Prime Minister to push for a three-level order. And so we had to backtrack 
um, and agree to a one-level order, the level of companion. So it was going to be one level for everyone. And at the last minute, they added what was called the Medal of Service of the Order of Canada, which was essentially like a second level, but it was disguised as something else, uh, with a Medal of uh, Service and a Medal of Courage to cover all the gallantry aspect. Uh, and we'll talk about that a bit later on. So that's what started it, along with the first Canadian commemorative medal in the form of the Centennial Medal, created in the same year. And so that was the nucleus uh, of the honor system that has grown since then. So, the aim of the system, as it is now, of course, is to recognize all fields of endeavors of all people. And our system is based on what the person has done and not who the person is. Unlike some of what we see, what we saw in the British system and what we see in many other countries. So, merit is the base of everything. And of course, the honor system helps to highlight people who've made a great contribution, create role models, you know, uh, emphasize and promote certain values, help with national unity, pride uh, in the country. So, basic principles uh, are as follows. The Queen is the font of honors, and that was insisted upon by the King in 1947 when he signed the letters patent constituting the Office of Governor General, that that was one thing that the King was not willing to delegate to his representative in Canada, he wanted to remain the font of honors. And in Canada, to this day, official honors are only created by and awarded on behalf of the sovereign. So that is the first rule. Anything created by another authority is not an official honor. There are awards, and we'll mention some later, but they are not official honors in the forms of order, dec orders, decorations, and medals. Insulation from politics. So I told you about the whole problem that we had during the First World War, and even before then. And in order to avoid that, what the Prime Minister did, which was uh, very unique, uh, and still is in many cases, is that the creation of all honor is a, a political act. How we recognize the citizenry in any country, of course, is a government policy. You decide that we will have honors, they will recognize this type of service, they will look like this, etc. However, what he did is that once an honor is created, the politicians take a step back and the selection of the actual recipients is done at arm's length from the government. So, a committee or a council was created of people that are no, no politicians sit on this. There are civil servants and representatives of various government offices and um, colleges and institutions and selected uh, members uh, from within the council, but there are no politicians. And the nominations, once they've been looked at by the council, do not go through the Prime Minister, but are presented directly to the Governor General for approval on behalf of the Queen. Therefore, the Prime Minister is not only consulted, he's not even informed until the awards are approved. This was unique in the 1960s, and it still is uh, quite rare in other countries. In the UK, as you probably know, the honors list, although they, know, they now have committees, the honors list still go through the Prime Minister's office. In France, any nomination has to go through a minister to be supported. And still, although some of them probably do it very well, it leaves the perception of political involvement which taints the honor system uh, because of that process. So in Canada, we made very, um, a very conscious decision to try and make clear that the honor system was completely separate from politics. And then the merit-based principle, again, it's, it's what you did, not who you are. Structure has remained very similar to what we knew with the British, where orders, usually multi-leveled, are there to recognize long-term merit. And one can be promoted within the order, one can only be admitted to an order if you're living, because the order itself is not the insignia, is the people making it. And you can also be kicked out. You can resign from it if you want, but if you do something that is really unsavory, you can be removed from the order. You know, we've had several examples of that with the Order of Canada, and even recently with the Order of Military Merit. Decorations, on the other hand, are awarded to a person, and usually to recognize one single act or meritorious service in a very specific time frame. So it can be gallantry under fire, it can be bravery in the face of danger, but not in a combat situation, or meritorious service uh, you know, in a project over a specific uh, initiative or leadership during a, an operational deployment or something like that. Decorations are awarded, it can be awarded posthumously, can be awarded to Canadian as well as allied military people and foreign recipients, 
and you can be awarded the same declaration several times, which is uh, several awards are represented by bars on the original declaration. Now, medals, there are different kinds of medals. The more common ones are the ones we know, campaign medals, uh, to recognize participation in a military operation uh, or a mission overseas or providing support to such missions. But there are also commemorative medals to commemorate important national anniversary. The last one was the Queen Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012. And of course, there are Long Service and Good Conduct Medal, uh, not only for the military, but also for the other protective services, like the police, the fire services, uh, emergency services, Coast Guard, prisons, and, and all of that. So that is the general structure. If we look at the idea of, uh, of the honor system, it works a bit like a pyramid, where national honors created by the crown are that you know, lighter gold at the top of the pyramid, and as you go down, then you have less formal recognition in the form of departmental awards, and then you go down to less formal, and then at the end you have you know, verbal praise and the good old handshake uh, at the very bottom. And the idea is that as you go closer to the top, the, or the awards are uh, more stringent. It's more difficult to attain, and they're fewer in numbers. But as you go down, the gener you can be a bit more generous, and they should be more easily attainable. With any honor, you always walk a very fine line uh, between not recognizing enough and making the honors appear unattainable and therefore removing the motivational value from them and recognizing too much and of course diluting the value of the honor, again affecting their uh, use as a motivation tool. If everybody's got it, what's the point, really? So you have to walk that fine line between giving enough to encourage people, but not too much that there's a feeling that it's, uh, it becomes meaningless. Uh, recognition is not just to recognize the person, of course. The state has an objective in this, uh, and, and we did not invent that. You can go to the orders of chivalry in the Middle Ages, and the point of these orders was for the king or the prince to gather around him people, you know, basically give them an honor to ensure their loyalty. And, you know, and service around him. And if we push that to the more modern concept, recognition is a basic human need. If you know the Maslow pyramid there, with you know you have to put a roof on your head and get fed and security and all of this, and as you go down that pyramid to the lesser critical um, you know, uh, uh, needs of the humans, you have needs such as recognition. People want to be recognized. They want to stand apart from the mass. Um, and that's what explains, you know, fancy cars and tattoos and fancy hairdos and all of that stuff. We don't want to be just like everyone else. We want to be a specific individual. And one of the states, the, the state, takes the time physically to identify, mark somebody as distinctive, distinguishing them with an honor, saying this person has done something great, this person is the embodiment of the values the state wants to promote, the aim of the state, of course, is not just to say thank you to that person, it's to motivate others, to try to inspire people to serve in the hope, most likely subconscious, that if they work hard and well like this person, they will too be recognized by the state, and therefore fulfill that need that is very uh, basic for humans. So that's how this works, but like I said, very difficult balance to maintain. Uh, and our system, unlike most systems in Europe that have grown over centuries, Basically, it's come from those two elements I mentioned before to this poster in the space of 50 years. So it has grown very quickly, and, and we have to be still very careful as uh, how we proceed from here. If we look at the modern system uh, compared to the previous one, this one actually covers all three main streams of individual recognition in terms of valor in combat in the first column, bravery in the face of danger, but not in a uh, fighting situation, and then merit. And the lines are level, so uh, the top level is Victoria Cross, Cross of Valor, which is our equivalent to the George Cross, the Order of Military Merit, which is for long-term merit. At level two, you've got the Star of Military Valor, which replaces things like the DSO, the NC, the NN, and things like that. The Star of Courage, which is our George Medal equivalent, and the Military Service Cross which would be a bit like the old leadership DSO uh, and some OBEs and MBEs for deployed operations and, and other types of service. And then level three, we have the Medal of Military Valor, which is the, 
equivalent of um, um, of the NN DFM uh, DSC. I'm sorry, I think I, I misspoke there. The um, at level two it was DSO, not MC. Uh, DSO, DCM, uh, conspicuous geometry medals, and those types of higher honors. Level three is all the crosses. Uh, DSC, MC, DFC, and the medals that are equivalent, Medal of Bravery is equivalent to Queen's Gallantry Medal, and the MSM. Mentioned dispatches has been restored, and of course we have those departmental awards at the bottom that complete the, uh, the pyramid. So um, those departmental awards are not honors from the crown, and that is why they are not worn on the ribbons or on the medals, they are worn separately. Uh, they are created uh, and awarded within the Canadian Forces for achievement that don't uh, meet the criteria for a national honor. So, how does this work nowadays? The nomination process. Um, anybody can start a nomination for a many person who is deserving. If we take an example uh, um, of combat in, uh, in Afghanistan, for example, maybe the war officer witnessed one of his corporals doing something great, he starts the recommendation, but it has to be supported by the CO. So it goes up, up the chain, supported by the CO, and it's going to make its way up the chain of command uh, at every level. And it was going to go up to the, what we call a level one. So these are the command uh, principles. And if they're supported all the way through there, then they're sent to us as the director of honors and recognition. And our job is to make sure that, one, the criteria is met, two, the you know, action is in line with precedence, and three, the numerical li limits where they, they uh, uh, are imposed are respected. That's especially vital for deployed operations so that we don't recognize people too much. There are certain quotas that are established for that. And if that is, um, uh, the, the three questions are answered with a positive, uh, then it goes to the appropriate committee. So either the Order of Military Merit Advisory Council, the Canadian Forces Declarations Advisory Committee, or the Order of St. John uh, Committee. And uh, the Order of Military and the Declarations one are chaired by the CDS himself. So it's General Vance who sits around the table with a three stars general uh, around the table and they decide this. So the chain of command really has ownership of this and they, they feel that this is very important and they take that extremely seriously. It used to be that the Declarations Committee was chaired by somebody much lower in rank, uh, but General Hillier during the Afghan campaign uh, changed that and has brought it right up to the CDS level and it has remained so ever since. Um, if the council or the committee supports the nomination, then the CDS sends a letter of recommendation directly to the Governor General, who then approves the award through an instrument on behalf of the Queen. We are informed, and then the commander who nominated the person informs the recipient that they have been recognized. Uh, and it's published, and eventually the person is invited to Rio Hall or the Citadel to receive their insignia from the Governor General. So the process can be, uh, you know, pretty quick, uh, and we've proven that on some cases. Uh, however, usually it takes several months uh, for the process to follow its course uh, and people to receive their recognition. There's great care that is taken to make sure that, um, because this is not one conflict, we have people all over the place. At the moment, we have you know, operations in Mali, which is peacekeeping. We have a training mission in the Ukraine. We have reassurance forces uh, on land in Latvia, at sea in the Black and the Mediterranean Sea, in the air uh, over Eastern Europe. So we have a number of operations ongoing that are different in nature, uh, but we have to make sure that the recognition is consistent and well balanced between all of these operations as well. So if we look at the specific elements, uh, of the honor system, I'm going to briefly cover the main parts that affect the Canadian Armed Forces. The Order of Military Merit was created in 1972, so five years after the Order of Canada. Initially, the intent of the Order of Canada was going to be a national order to cover all services, including the military service, a bit like the Légion d'honneur in France. Uh, there would be no distinction between a military and a, uh, a, a civilian Order of Canada. But like I mentioned, the Order of Canada at the beginning was one level with that Medal of Service attached to it. And the numbers were extremely limited. And there had been a drought of civilian recognition since 1919. So for over 50 years, uh, there had been no recognition for the people who actually built Canada to what we knew at the time of the centennial. There was a huge backlog of deserving recipients. And by, you know, uh, by force, there were very few military people recognized, and the ones that were recognized were usually you know, top generals with Second World War and Korea service. 
uh, and, and not regular serving members of the Canadian forces. And so pretty much immediately in 67, we started to push to have our own order to be able to recognize people at all rank levels who are not necessarily great generals with Second World War service. And the result was the creation of the Order of Canada, like I said, in 72, with three levels, commander, officer, and member. And the level of appointment is related to the level of responsibility of the person. So it's not really rank, although it's usually uh, pretty much parallel. In general, it means that general officers who have strategic effect get the commander level, senior officers have the officer level, and uh, captains and below receive the MMM level. But again, there are exceptions to this. We've had brigadier generals who've been made officers. We've had uh, you know, um, captains who've been made officers, and majors who've been made members, and, and these types of, uh, of iterations. Um, what has been important also is to make sure that the order is representative of the Canadian Armed Forces. And we've had some struggles. At the beginning, it actually worked quite well. We had very uh, uh, wide array of ranks represented in the order, and people with many different types of service, and younger people being appointed. In the very first list in 1972, there were 12 people on the list that did not even have their CD. So they didn't even have uh, 12 years of service, and they were appointed to the order of military. We don't see that nowadays, in part because since 72, of course, we've created a range of other decorations to recognize specific activities, and the order is very much limited to a career uh, of a deserving service. Uh, but still, the years of service have moved up, uh, and some of the ranks are no longer as well represented as they used to be. So in recent years, there's been an effort to try to make sure that when we look on CPAC, the ceremony at Rio Hall of people going forward to pick up their insignia, it is a reflection of the Canadian forces. Uh, in terms of years of service, in terms of trades, in terms of gender, uh, in terms of languages, uh, reserve uh, versus regular force, and, and all of that. And we've made progress on many fields, but there's still some efforts to be done uh, in this. I should mention, in 72, this is when the Order of Canada was modified to go to the three levels that we know now. So the companion was retained. Those who had received the Medal of Service who always felt a bit like second-class citizens, because, of course, the companion had this gold enameled with jewel, you know, stones in the crown and all of that beautiful neck badge, and the Medal of Service was sort of a silver snowflake, much small, no enamel, no stones, no nothing. So they sort of felt a bit left out when sometimes the achievements were very significant still. Uh, and so all of the recipients of the Medal of Service became officers of the Order of Canada. Nice neck badge, enamel, and everything. Just slightly smaller than the companions and with a gold maple leaf instead of a red one. And then the new level of member was introduced as the third level. And that's when also the uh, Medal of Courage, which had never been awarded, was scrapped. The Military Valor Decorations. These are actually the latest uh, you know, uh, addition to the family of decorations uh, because they were not created until 1993. And the very simple reason for that was that, for the main part, we had no use of them. Uh, after the Korean War, of course, Canada, with Lester B. Pearson and the first UNEF in Egypt, we led with peacekeeping. We were not doing a lot of war fighting, and therefore, people were saying, you know, so what, what about the VC? We've created the Order of Canada, and as we'll see later, we've created a, a, a range of bravery decorations. What about gallantry decorations? And, and people were sort of brushing that question aside, saying, well, we're not at war, and there's no prospect of us going to war, so let's not worry about that too much. And, and the veterans associations, in particular, were concerned about the possibility of using the Victoria Cross still in Canada. And, you know, various governments made some uh, statements. Um, some people said, yeah, it's still possible for Canada to make recommendations, and the Royal Warrants for the VC actually mentioned that. Um, but at one point, Prime Minister Trudeau, the first, mentioned that, you know, Canadians should really get Canadian decorations, but left it at that without any further details. In the 1980s, the Legion managed to convince uh, Prime Minister Mulroney that really the Victoria Cross should be the top Canadian honor for gallantry. But then again, it sort of fizzled away. There was no real need there. But in the background of national defense, they started to, to create a proposal um, to, to have gallantry decorations. They said, yeah, there's no war. But if one, if one comes, uh, we have to be prepared and have something in place as opposed to trying to rush at the last minute. So they tried to develop a proposal to create Canadian gallantry decorations. And initially, the 
Rito Hall was saying, well, we can just use the bravery decorations, and maybe we can put like cross swords on the ribbon or something like that. But the military, the chain of command, was saying, absolutely not. Uh, you know, gallantry under fire in a combat situation is quite distinct from demonstrating bravery in other circumstances, like running into a burning house or, or jumping in a fast flowing river to save somebody. And he said, we need distinct um, you know, decorations to recognize that uh, difference. And so, despite what the Prime Minister had stated publicly uh, to the Legion about the Victoria Cross, it looks like this small part of information uh, was lost on national defense and immediately went forward with a, a proposal for three brand new Canadian decorations, a medal, a star, and a cross, uh, but similar to the Cross of Valor, uh, so a neck badge with, uh, you know, in the same shape, different colors, but it was going to call the Cross of Canada or the Canada Cross, the name evolved with time. Um, and, and so that's the proposal that progressed. And, and then happened the Gulf War. So for the first time since Korea, Canada is at war. And we have planes bombing targets, and we have troops on the grounds and ships at sea, and this is a war. And conveniently enough, um, in early February of 1991, as we were in the thick of it, after two weeks that the actual war part has started at the end of January, uh, front page news of the Globe and Mail uh, Victor a cross to be ditched to be replaced by a new Canadian, you know, cross of um, Canada cross or something like that. And of course, there was a huge uproar. Uh, not only veterans and the Legion, uh, but also civic organizations like the Monarchist League of Canada, historians, veterans of any stripe were quite upset uh, at this, uh, you know, uh, new proposal, which of course went directly against what the Prime Minister had previously stated. And so, uh, initially the government said, oh, well, we're, we're going to go ahead with this, uh, there's no problem here, and, and try to keep carry on. Uh, but eventually, uh, you know, this did not fly because the, the uh, volume of the criticism just kept rising. Uh, however, the Gulf War, as you know, didn't last very long, and by March, uh, the combat part of that was over. And the problem sort of went away, and the government just put this on the back burner quietly, um, and, and hoping that the problem would go away. The trouble is that one of the, their own MPs, a conservative, had put a motion in Parliament to restore the Victoria Cross, and that made its way through Parliament. And as time went by, the uh, MP, McPhee, actually managed to convince people of all parties to support this idea of keeping the Victoria Cross as Canada's top level. And of course, it would have been slightly problematic um, for the government uh, to have one of their own MPs put a motion had it succeed in Parliament. And of course, honors are not created usually by acts of Parliament. It's, it's done by the royal prerogative on the recommendation of the government. And so the Prime Minister essentially uh, directed the Honors Policy Committee to have a second look at this proposal, which if you read between the lines made it pretty clear what needed to be done, and the Victoria Cross was back in. So, a Victoria Cross for Canada, very much following the, what the Australians had just done in 1991 in keeping the same physical decoration, but having it created by the Queen of Australia under Australian regulations to be approved by Australian authorities alone. And so we did essentially the same thing, created a Victoria Cross for Canada, the uh, second level with the star and the third level of the, with the medal. We also created in 1991, that one managed to get through in the Gulf War, uh, a modern equivalent of the mentioned dispatches. Now, the only difference, of course, with the, uh, with the Victoria Cross uh, for Canada is that design is slightly different than the original. Generally speaking, it looks the same, but the motto, which was only in English, for valor, uh, on the original one, was changed in a last minute uh, change to the Latin equivalent pro valor. Uh, because somebody said, well, if we're going through all this effort to make this decoration Canadian, you know, given the current laws in Canada, it would be a bit weird to have uh, a unilingual model on it. And so that small change was made at the last minute, and the Queen quite readily agreed to that. Uh, of course, the manufacturer is quite distinct as well. Uh, I could give you another presentation on that, but uh, we would be here for a long time, so we'll skip that. Um, of course, the criteria for those, it has to be gallantry in combat in the face of an armed enemy, which means that these cannot be used in a peacekeeping context. Because in a peacekeeping context, although there are sometimes bullets flying, and for the people on the ground, it does look like war uh, at times, 
In theory, there are no armed enemies in a peacekeeping context. There are conflicting parties. And our job as armed forces is not to be there to destroy them as a valid fighting entity, but is to be there to interpose ourselves between forces that have agreed to our presence to make sure that we implement you know, uh, agreements or UN uh, Security Council resolutions or uh, an armistice of some kind or facilitate peace building. So, in peacekeeping context, we use other decorations like the bravery ones. The mention in dispatch can be used for peacekeeping uh, and of course the military service decorations, but those ones are strictly reserved for combat operations. So, of course, the Gulf War was long over by the time they were created, and they were used for the first time during the Afghanistan campaign. Uh, so we had about 40,000 people served during that 13-year mission in Afghanistan, and we awarded 20 stars of military valor and 89 medals of military valor during that time. And when you read the citations uh, of those recipients, they are uh, very, very impressive indeed. The awards can be made posthumously, and there have been a few of those. The awards can also be made to Allied members serving under our command. And in fact, three uh, American soldiers were recognized, one with a star and two with the medal. Uh, in Afghanistan as well. Compared to the British system, uh, all of our decorations are rank and service neutral. So regardless of your Air Force, Navy, or Army, an officer or an NCM, the only thing that directs which decoration you're going to get is the level of gallantry that has been displayed. That's all. There are numerical limits, and in a war situation like Afghanistan or Iraq at the moment, the limit is one nomination per 250 people under command for every period of six months, which is exactly the same uh, quota, if you wish, that was used during the Second World War and in Korea for British gallantry decorations. So we kept that tradition. And in that picture there, that's Sergeant Patrick Tower, who was the very first recipient of the Star of Military Valor, uh, announced in 2006 and presented in February of 2007 here at the Chateau Laurier in Ottawa. So uh, this is the structure for gallantry, and you have next to it what it replaced in the British system. And of course we have the addition of the uh, commendations, which are used very, uh, in a very flexible manner to recognize either a lower level of gallantry, a lower level of bravery, or even a lower level of major service. So it, it serves as a uh, basically junior version of all the basic decorations. Bravery decorations, so those are not for combat, and these are not specifically military. These are open to any Canadian who put their own lives at risk, knowingly, in order to save or attempt to save somebody. Uh, created in 1972, replacing the uh, you know, impractical Medal of Courage, which had never been awarded, so it existed in theory between 67 and 72, uh, and, and it was quickly obvious that it was not practical to recognize all levels of bravery with one honor. Um, so that one was abolished, those three were introduced, and one thing that really pushed the introduction of those was the Kootenai incident. Uh, HMCS Kootenai had this devastating um, engine room explosion, several people got killed, and a number of gallantry acts uh, took place there, and the very first cross uh, of valor, and the, I don't know about the cross of valor, but stars of courage, yes, and there were crosses of valor uh, issued there as well. Uh, the very first recipients were for the Kootenai, that was in 69. So it still took three years to push to the system the creation of those decorations. So far, 20 crosses of valor have been issued in 45 plus years. Uh, over 400 now stars and well over 3,000 medals of bravery have been awarded. And here you have the picture of one of our last CF recipient. Um, this is now Chief Warner of Sir uh, Mitchell, cross of valor. Member of the Order of Military Merit, recipient of the Major Service Medal, for good measure. Um, a great chap, uh, Sartek, and uh, he and his colleague, now Chief Warrant Officer Piers, who was also a member of the Order of Military Merit and recipient of the Major Service Cross, also for good measure, um, uh, both earned the cross back in 1998 for a very daring ninth parachute rescue in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, again, a hair raising citation if there is one. Major Service decorations. Um, two levels, a cross and a medal. And these are, if the order of military merit recognizes long-term merit, these are basically short-term merit. So it is, we say, from five minutes to five years. So it can be one single action, or it can be major service going above and beyond what is expected of somebody in a certain rank, certain position, with a certain expertise uh, for, you know, a project, 
uh, an operational rotation, uh, you know, a tour of duty here in Canada, um, but they can be used for that. And again, unlike the OMM, the level of award is only based on the impact of the merit of the person. So a, so a private can get the cross and a full general can get the medal, and this has happened. Uh, and, and recently, again, we had a corporal and a master seaman and a war officer getting the cross, and we have, you know, uh, three-star generals getting the medal, and that's exactly what it's supposed to be. Um, the cross was inst instituted in '84 to be a, a sort of a, a fill gap between the Order of Military Merit and the newly created CDS Commendation, which was created in 1974, and then the NSM was added in '91, when it was quickly realized that there was not enough flexibility to recognize the levels of recognition. But so far, this has worked very well. Uh, we've awarded, uh, we are over 230 crosses, and we're well over 850 medals in the military division. In 1991, when the medal was created, there's also an equivalent civil division that was created that is uh, being used uh, again now after a, a sort of a gap of about 10 years, but it's being awarded now. Chris Hatfield, for example, is the only Canadian who earned the NSC both in the military division, his first flight in space was as a colonel, military, got the NSC, and his flight, you know, the Gakar one a few years ago, as a civilian, got the NSC in the civil division. The only Canadian wears the two NSCs with the two different ribbons. Uh, we have some interesting combinations. We have people who have the cross and the medal. Uh, we have somebody here, Colonel Saint C, um, the group that's in the middle, uh, who received the NSM three times. So two bars on the NSM. We now have somebody who has the cross, the medal, and a bar to the medal. Uh, so very interesting combinations that are uh, coming up here. This uh, captain, oh, I forget his name, Aaron, I think. Uh, he was a, a helicopter pilot. And you can see there, barely on his chest, on the same day he received both the cross and the medal. And these two are his first medals on his uniform for distinct, you know, separate flight missions. Uh, usually involving rescues and things like that. So that was uh, quite impressive. And of course, up uh, top right is Captain Goddard, uh, the first female killed in combat uh, in Canadian history, uh, in, in the combat arms. And uh, she received an NSM, a posthumous uh, NSM, um, for her service in Afghanistan. Departmental awards, I'm going to go over this very quickly, like I said, created within the department. There's one from the Chief of Defense Staff, which is gold, since 1974 for anything that basically falls short of, of a national honor. And below it, in 1995, was added a command commendation. These are awarded by 10 authorized commanders, like the of the Army or the uh, Chief Military Personnel, uh, for achievements that reflect well on the command itself. We have the CF Medallion for Distinguished Service, which is like an equivalent for civilian recipients that contribute to the Canadian Forces. Casualty recognition has been transformed tremendously uh, because of the Afghan campaign. Of course, I've already mentioned the Memorial Cross created in 1919. That one had to be changed. Because 1919 is a long time ago. And the construct of a family and the value we put on life has evolved a great deal in 100 years. Of course, it was focused back then, two crosses maximum, widow if the person was married, and mother if she was still alive when the member died. Well, we found ourselves in Afghanistan with a Captain Goddard. We did not have a widow. She had a widower, and the regulations prevented us from giving him the cross. Well, that made no sense. Um, we had situations where people no longer had a mother and a wife. They had a same-sex partner, or they have reconstituted families, and you know it just did not line up with the reality. And we had increasingly, well, why just the mother and, and widow? What about the father or the husband? And so what was decided was to increase the number from two to three so that one could recognize their spouse and parents, whatever they may be. Uh, but also, we're not going to say the parent and the spouse are going to be the recipients. We're going to let the members pick who they want. Who are we to decide who will suffer most if something unfortunate happens to you? So now as part of the administration, like you fill their will and who you have to advise if something bad happens, you fill a form to say, who are the three people that should get the cross if something bad happens? And that's the way it works now. We also created, in 2012, the Memorial Ribbon. So only three crosses often leaves other people in a family that are closely affected without recognition. And it was a desire, especially for children, to have a small memento. And the ribbon came to fill that gap, and up to five are granted to the families, uh, usually to children. 
the memorial scroll uh, was a tradition, a British tradition of the First World War that all uh, Canadian fallen of the Great War received. Uh, we did not use the British equivalent for the Second World War or the Korean War, but we sort of created a new Canadian version in 2009 for all deaths from 2001 onwards. We actually went to the effort of scanning an original First World War scroll from a collection at the War Museum. Using a special program, we created a font, because this was not a font like you have Times New Roman on your computer. This was actually a poem, uh, or a text that was written by the poet laureate at the time, and it was actually calligraphied and then made into a printing block. It's not a font that exists. So we actually made the font using the letters from the original text and retyped the new text to match, uh, trying to respect the spirit of the wording as much as possible while adapting it, of course, to our needs. Uh, and the format as well with the royal arms and the cipher uh, was uh, emulated from the original. The memorial bar was something that was created by Canada uh, during the Second World War. Because unlike during the First World War, Second World War campaign medals were not engraved with the name of the recipient. And this was particularly offensive to the families of the fallen, who after the, the war, several years after the war, in 47, 48, 49, received a box of medals with loose ribbons with no names on them. And that was the testament you know, to, to their fallen family member. And there was a lot of pressure in Parliament. And of course, we issued millions of medals in the Second World War. We had 1.1 million people in uniform in the Second World War all of whom qualified for two, two, six, seven, eight medals each. Uh, recalling all those, naming them with the potential errors and reshipping them was just something that was not really practical or economical. So it was decided that for the fallen, we would create this bar that could be affixed to a frame or uh, a picture to commemorate the, the, the deceased. Um, and, and those were issued for the Second World War. And a few years back, I was talking to my colleagues at VAC, and they said, we found this whole box of stuff cleaning up a vault here and they had found a whole box of blank memorial bars from the Second World War. And they wanted to get rid of it. I said, no, no, I'll take this, thank you very much. <laughs> and so from 2001, we basically restored the tradition and we still grant the memorial bar to the families now. And of course, the big change was the sacrifice now. Introduced, uh, well announced in 08 and launched in 2009 to recognize all those that are wounded by hostile action or die as a result of military service. So the posthumous aspect is actually broader than the combat. Anybody who die because of their military service, could be a disease or an accident or anything like that, are covered by the medal. But the living aspect of the medal is really a combat award, equivalent of the wound strike that we had before. It has to be the direct result of hostile action, has to be serious enough to require it written by MO, and has to be documented. And it covers both physical and psychological wounds. In the modern Canadian forces, uh, visible and invisible wounds are considered equal and are equally uh, eligible for that medal so long, of course, as they meet the same criteria. Medals, I'm going to go again uh, pretty, uh, very quickly over this, uh, recognize campaign uh, and operational service, and we've created a whole range of those medals now to recognize the various types of service. You know, in combat with an armed enemy, uh, operations that are sort of peacekeeping or where there's still a, a, a level of risk and then sort of the lower um, risk medal uh, or operation support for operations, the special service medal. Commemorative medals, I have already mentioned, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee and of course our Canadian Forces Decoration, which is our long service medal. So I went slightly over time here and I was talking faster and faster. I hope you were able to follow. <laughs> but I, I only hope to give you a brief uh, overview of the system, how it evolved, and how it is used now. It is hugely important for any military force to recognize their members. It is part of uh, the leadership toolbox to make sure the morale is strong, the esprit de corps is solid, because that has a direct impact on the operational effectiveness of your force. And the CDS and the leadership Canadian forces are very insistent that this be a strong system and that it be used appropriately and that recognition be provided in a timely fashion. You know, I mentioned Second World War, people had to wait until 1948 and 49 to get their medals. Right now, you deploy to Iraq, to Afghanistan, to the Ukraine or to Latvia, you will get your medal with your name engraved on it in theater from your commander before you come back to Canada. So that's how timely recognition has become important and that's why we, that's how we try to recognize our people. So I hope this was useful, and I'm willing to take any questions you may have. Yes? Um, 
Can you talk about the meetings that are held uh, with the, the senior generals at them? Yeah. How often does that happen in a year? So the Order of Military Merit uh, Council meets only once a year. It's a one-year cycle. But the Canadian Forces Decorations Advisory Council meets every two months, except in summer. So it's usually five times a year. So we had a meeting just in early February, and the next one is 10 April. So it is fairly frequent, and the number of files depends, of course, on the operational tempo. It can go from 10 to 12 files. Uh, at the last meeting, we had 17, and sometimes it's 35, 40 uh, files. So, yeah, so that's the frequency of the meetings. The lower awards, like I mentioned in dispatches and the departmental awards, don't go to a community. Once they've gone through all the levels, they get to, to me at DHNR. We look. If it meets, you know, criteria, quota, uh, precedent, we send it straight to the CES and he says yes or no, and that's that. You know, it's a commendation, it's not the VC, so we have to, again, to try to make things timelier, we try to make the system a bit more streamlined for the lower rewards. I'm going to try to keep this brief, because this is a very interesting story, uh, and a very complex one. Uh, as you probably know, the Victoria Cross is made from gun metal. The legend has it that the original Victoria Cross was made from guns captured from the Russians at Sevastopol. And we know the metal used for the crosses from 1856 to 1914 was consistently from the same source, although we don't really know what that source was, but we can presume maybe that the history is correct. Uh, in 1914, that source ran out. And since then, the British VC has been made, almost all of them, from guns that are Chinese in origin. Uh, we don't know where they came from. Uh, and they cut the cascabel at the back, which is that sort of bulbous protrusion where you put the recoil cables around. Um, so they cut those, and the VCs have been made out of those two cascabels since 1914, except for a brief period in 1943, when the stock had been moved because of Luftwaffe bombing, but that, of course, was not publicized for fear to give the Luftwaffe a propaganda coup. Uh, and they used another source of metal for a short period of time, but it was found again in a different depot and, and, and all went back to normal. So, when Canada created its Victoria Cross, the, initially the intent was to do exactly like the Australians and say, yes, we've changed the model, but we're going to use the same metal, uh, have it made in the UK by Hancock, the jewelers who made them all since, you know, 1856. Same casting method, everything else. However, this was 1993, 94, 95. We get into the Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin era of big budget cuts to try to put the Canada back into the, uh, into the black. And everybody suffered, including the Chancery of Honours. And their budget was slashed. And you know there was no immediate need for the Victoria Cross just then. The Gulf War was over. So again, it was pushed to the back. It's only in the early 2000s that the topic about OK, this exists on paper since 1993. Maybe we have to make some. Uh, and of course, the pressure uh, you know, increased substantially when we got involved in Afghanistan, because now we were in combat. Uh, and so the topic of manufacture came around. And of course, we at DMD said, OK, the plan was that then, in 93, let's go to the Brits, have it made, same thing. But the mood had changed in the government in that, those intervening years. And it was a strong desire that the Victoria Cross be made in Canada of Canadian methods. And of course, we didn't know there was a firm in Canada that could make the Victoria Cross to the specifications that we wanted. And of course, Canadian metals, what would that be? Uh, all sorts of ideas floated from using you know, uh, guns uh, captured at Vimy, uh, which of course are steel and not bronze. You can't cast things out of steel to make metals. It just doesn't work. Uh, some people said, well, let's use uh, you know, one of those ties from the, the, the railway, uh, you know, the, the last um, spike uh, on the, the, the Great Railway. But of course, that's steel again, uh, and not bronze. And of course, most of those railways in 1885 were uh, manufactured by Krupp, the German company, that made a lot of the armament that killed our soldiers in the two world wars. So the symbolics was not ideal. Uh, somebody said, well, Victoria Cross, Queen Victoria, you know, in a museum in Quebec City, there's that statue. Uh, that we could use parts of, but it had been blown up by the FLQ, so that didn't fly. Um, so he said, well, maybe we could use the bell from the Peace Tower, the original t Victoria Tower, you know, that burned down in 1916. The bell crashed down, it's behind part of the building. Maybe we can use parts of that. Again, there were some, of course, issues with heritage uh, with that. And, you know, and the government was insistent that it had to be purely Canadian material. And we at DMD, I went to the Canadian, I said, listen, uh, I can understand the Canadian component, but a lot of the mystique of the original Victoria Cross is linked 
to the, what it's made out of. There's, there's that aura, that history, that patina that you cannot manufacture. You know, if you wanted so can you, are you going to carve it out of moose antler and dip it in maple syrup? You know, I don't know what you're going to make it out of. But I said, whatever you do, it has to have at least part of that original method. Otherwise, we don't want it. And that gave them some pause, of course, because we're the clients, we're the Canadian forces. And we said, OK, good Canadian, but we have to preserve the history and the link to the 81 or 95, depending on how you count, Canadians who've earned that declaration before and that we're using as examples. So, in the end, what I suggested is that, okay, we're going to do the usual Canadian compromise. We're going to make things. We're going to ask the Queen of the United Kingdom if she'd be willing to give to the Queen of Canada a piece of the original gun metal. And the two queens agreed very quickly. So <laughs> <very simple. laughs> uh, and then we're going to mix that with metal of a Canadian source. What was that going to be? After all the silly ideas that we had, some of them were mine too, but... Uh, we decided to, and that's the, design, the designer of the VC, Bruce Beattie, there, uh, and that's the sample up there of what the Cross of Canada would have looked like, essentially a Cross of Valor enameled white. Uh, but that's the final design approved by the Queen, designed by Bruce, uh, there on the left with approved Elizabeth R. And that's the central element redesigned by Kathy Versace Sabre of the Chesley of Honors back in the 2000s when we actually proceeded with the manufacturing. And that up there was an early idea of the ribbons made by, uh, by, the, by D&D when the first ideas were thrown around in 1990 or something like that. It was inspired by the DFC, obviously. So here we have it. I decided, because I was discussing this with Chris McCreary, some of you may know him, uh, important uh, honors historian Canada, has written a, you know, about 15 books on this stuff. And uh, I, we were discussing this in my office in Uplands. And I happen to have a Confederation Medal on my list. I said, what about this? Confederation Medal, I know there's about 30 of them left that have never been awarded since 1867 in a vault at Canadian Heritage. This was, it's not an honor per se, but it was created by the government of Canada to mark Confederation. As Queen Victoria on the front, you know, Victoria Cross, was paid by the government of Canada to symbolize the birth of our nation. What about we take one from Canadian Heritage and we mix it with the original British metal, which is the slice that we got there in that triangular piece. And that idea worked, but the government insisted that we also have, or the committee, I should say, that we also have a modern aspect, because the Confederation Medal is 67, it's the birth of Canada. It was still made in the UK by Pinches. Uh, they wanted to have something like materially Canadian in there, and so we added a third element, which is metal uh, mined or naturally found in Canada, so tin and lead and things like that. Uh, from various, all the regions of Canada were represented and National Resources Canada provided that to us. Uh, and, and so these are the three components mixed together, created the Victoria Cross alloy, which was dubbed the Rideau alloy. And the Victoria Cross, the last thing we wanted was to go to tender, you know, and the lowest bidder was going to make the Victoria Cross for Canada and be able to say on their website, you know, we made this and, and we did not want that. Um, and we were also very concerned that, you know, the security of the dyes and the metal, uh, we were also concerned about the quality uh, and the workmanship. We didn't know if anybody was going to be able to make this. And in the end, after a lot of research, we found out that we, the government, can actually make this. The Mint can make the tooling, can finish it, and Natural Resources Canada can do casting. And so that's what happened. We, because we wanted to make it the same way as the original, by casting and not by striking. You know, metals are usually struck with dyes. The Victoria Cross, because of the poor quality of the original metal, has always been cast in sand molds. We didn't go to sand molds, we went to ceramic molds, but we still went to casting. And so you have the various designs and the dyes to make the wax seals, and then to make the, uh, the wax tree, which is then embedded into plaster. The plaster is heated to, to harden it as the lost wax process. And so you heat it up, the wax goes, it leaves a cavity, which is a negative with the Victoria Cross, and then you pour the Rideau alloy into the, uh, the hole, and then you get a Victoria Cross tree, uh, and, and then you cut it and finish it and patinate it, and, and there you have a Victoria Cross. Oops. So um, that was a short version of the answer. That's what the Victoria Cross is made out of. Three metals. VC metal, Canada, Confederation metal, and Canadian metal. Thank <laughs> you.